We have a busy household. When we moved into our house, uh, there were 10 of us. We had eight kids and uh, Jory and me. Uh, since then, we added a ninth child, uh, but six have moved out. Uh, but we still have five of us. It's still pretty busy. And uh, when we don't have guests over, uh, our house tends to pile up with stuff and get dirty. Then when we have people coming over, we fly into action to get it all ready. We want to make a good impression. You do the same thing, don't you? We're all kind of that way. Um, I remember, uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago, uh, Jory took three of our girls out shopping on Saturday, and I stayed home to pay bills and do some household projects. But after a while, I kind of, you know, laid down on the couch and started watching some uh, football on TV and, and some news. Then when I heard the garage door open and the car come in, I quickly turned it off and jumped up so I'd look real busy the whole time they were gone. I mean, come on, uh, we get embarrassed when the boss finds us goofing off, when the teacher uh, finds us playing around or the coach finds us horsing uh, around, uh, when you get a phone call uh, and you're still in bed. I, I've had calls where uh, I jump up and, hello, did I get you up? No, 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 I'm up, you know. Uh, um, the Apostle Paul says the Lord Jesus Christ is returning, and we've all been given warning to wake up and be ready. Uh, tomorrow we celebrate the birth of the first coming of Christ, but we're also to live ready for the second coming of Christ. Turn in your Bible to Romans 13, uh, 8 to 14. If you want to use the, our Bibles, it's on page 1,138. Romans 13, 11, and do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. He says the hour has almost come. The night is coming to an end. The day is, is dawning. Uh, the, Christ coming is nearer now than at any time in the past. God has nothing else on his calendar, Paul says, between now and the return of Christ. We want to live ready for Christ's return. I don't want to be hustling around the house cleaning up when he comes. I don't want to be embarrassed. I think about this frequently. I don't want to be caught when he returns again doing something stupid or wrong. It'd be embarrassing. Parents, talk to your kids about living ready for Christ's return. Whether you're an empty nester, married, Single, divorced, widowed, remarried, teenager, we need to learn to live ready for Christ's return. So how do we live ready for Christ's return? Paul suggests two ways. The first way we live ready for Christ's return is to love our neighbor. Verse 8, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and whatever other command there may be are summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. The second half of the Ten Commandments can be summed up by the words, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, if you're ever wondering how to love somebody else, read the Ten Commandments. Paul says that love does no harm to a neighbor. Uh, the last five sins forbidden in the Ten Commandments all do harm to a neighbor. Murder robs them of their life. Adultery of their home and honor. Theft of their property. False witness of their good name. While covetousness robs us all of contentment. All of these do harm to a neighbor. Paul says we're to live ready for Christ's return, and we do so when we love our families, love our friends, uh, love our coworkers, our classmates, our teammates, or fellow church members. We love them the way we naturally love ourselves. We do for them what we would want them to do for us. When we go above and beyond, 
To love people, even people we don't know very well, it makes an impression. When we show respect to other drivers, if we allow others to get the better parking spot, uh, we express love. When we live, leave a generous tip when we're in a restaurant, we express love in tangible, meaningful ways that others can appreciate. And believe me, they notice. Uh, Chuck Swindoll, the 84-year-old uh, uh, senior pastor at Stonebriar, a community church in Frisco, Texas, uh, a church of about 10,000, uh, writes of this letter that one of his uh, people sent to him. I'm sending this message to let you know how much members of your church have m touched my life. Four years ago, my husband and I lived in a small two-bedroom apartment with our two small children when we were suddenly stunned, blessed, and challenged by the birth of identical triplet boys. Now, that'd be a way to increase your family in a hurry. All of our family lived 1,000 miles away, and we had no help. Three weeks after they both were born, and the day after they came home from the hospital, I had to get a job. To pay for diapers and formula, I got a job waitressing at a restaurant near your church. I was still in immense pain and was truly frightened that this was more than my family could handle. On that first day at work, I waited on a group of people from your church. They were single adults. I'd been a waitress in college and knew that Christians or people coming from church were not only horrible tippers, but also very difficult and rude. But I was pleasantly surprised. They noticed that I was a little slow and instead of complaining, they were forgiving. They even asked about my life and learned about my situation with the triplets. This group continued to come in on Sundays, and I felt honored to serve them. They'd ask me about my children and encourage me in ways I needed. They lifted my spirits in ways I can't describe. It made me look at waitressing as a way of serving people for God. I'd say a prayer when I dropped off a plate of food or, uh, or thought of a blessing to give them. I'd been feeling so confused about God and his plans, and then out of nowhere, this group of Christians entered my life in such a strange way, and they gave me comfort. Our first Christmas with the triplets was financially devastating. We were barely paying our bills. The group didn't come in to eat, to my disappointment, but they came in and left an envelope with a lot of money. I went shopping at Toys R Us that night on my way home from work and cried the entire time. C couldn't have done Toys R Us this year. They're gone. <laughs> I know I was getting a lot of strange looks, but I didn't care. It has been years now since that singles group from Stonebriar uh, came in. My husband was transferred back to Chicago and now makes enough money where I can stay home with our children seven days a week. Things are much, much better now. That whole experience recently came to mind, and I wanted to let you know that something very special happened in my life to make me a Christian. I thank God for having served this group. They didn't have to reach out to her. She was just their waitress, but they loved her. Paul says we should have no debts except a debt of love. After all the mercy God has extended to us, in sending his son, we have a debt of love to God and to people. Paul says a debt of love is the only debt we should have. Let no debt remain outstanding. It would appear that Paul gives a prohibition against any borrowing, carrying any debt. Some biblical teachers have used this verse to discourage credit cards, auto loans, mortgages, or even church buildings. Uh, loans. It'd be magnificent if no one of us ever needed to borrow money, but sometimes the only way you can buy a house, start a business, or go to school is to get a loan. Uh, people ask me from time to time, do you have a mortgage on the church? I says, yes, but it's a manageable one. I mean, people in this church gave so generously, we have a relatively small uh, mortgage. And some people take kind of a pious tone and say, why do you have a mortgage? I said, well, because we preferred not to meet in the rain. <laughs> I mean, we could still be at Whitford renting and paying money to others down the drain. Or we could do it to a permanent cause on a mortgage. 
serving the people God has brought us. Nevertheless, we must be disciplined and wise with debt. Financial consultant Dave Ramsey suggests never borrowing for anything of depreciating value, like furniture, jewelry, uh, cell phones, or technology, or uh, furniture, or cars, or vacation. Uh, don't carry credit card debt. Pay your balance every month. Uh, the exceptions might be a business loan, a home mortgage, or education loan. But we have to be wise. Uh, the, Dave Ramsey's three children all got jobs starting in ninth grade to, to, to make money for college, and they all went to in-state colleges uh, with, the, with the lowest tuition. And not one of them borrowed a dime for college or graduate school. Many students today are graduating swamped in debt. Paul's point is simple. Be a person who fulfills your obligations. Don't make creditors track you down. Pay off what you owe. The only debt we should have is a debt to love people. Verse 8, let no, one rem let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Uh, the command to love others goes beyond loving our family, our friends, our co-workers, our classmates. Uh, the, the, the Greek word Paul uses, heteros, it means one different from you. We're to love people with different beliefs, different politics, of different races, different backgrounds. We're to love everyone. When we love others, we make knowing Christ very attractive to those who may not believe. Uh, Clarence Day, in his book, uh, Loving Father, uh, has a scene in there that the book was made into a movie and Vinnie, the wife, is talking to her husband who's called father in the, in the movie and uh, she says to him, uh, hey, uh, the rector's coming for tea today. And he groans and he says, well, good. Well, then I'll go to the, uh, to the gym. She says, ah, I wish you cared more about spiritual things and church. He says, getting... Me into heaven is your job. I mean, everybody loves you and God loves you. She says, well, I'll try my best, but heaven won't be heaven without you. And then he answers in the line that I think is the best one in the book. He says, Vinny, I would do anything to get into heaven with you, even if it means climbing over a fence. In other words, she loves him so well that he would do anything to go to heaven with her. And that's Paul's point. He says we're to love our parents so well, love our children so well, love our coworkers so well, or our teammates or classmates so well that they would do anything to find out about the Christ who compels us to love them. Loving others is a good way to live ready for Christ's return. Verse 11, and do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Knowing that Christ's return is nearer now than any time in the past, we want to love people. When Christ return, we don't want him to find us fighting with our mate or arguing with our parent or having a spat with a sibling. We want him to discover us being kind and gracious. The second way to live ready for Christ's return is to live in obedience. How do we live in obedience? Paul suggests three ways. They are all double sentences showing us both the negative and the positive aspect of obedience. Uh, he first uses the metaphor of night and day, darkness and light. It concerns our clothing and what, in the light of the time, we should wear, what's appropriate. Um, verse 12, so let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Because of the hour, we must not only wake up and get up, but we need to get dressed. We must take off our night clothes, the deeds of darkness, and put on instead suitable uh, equipment for a soldier of Christ, the armor of light. 
For the Christian's life is not a sleep, but a battle. We are in a battle for our lives and for the lives of other people. January 31, 1968, the North Vietnamese began the Tet Offensive. It was called the Tet Offensive because it happened during Tet, the Chinese New Year. It was a surprise attack. 85,000 North Vietnamese soldiers surprised the Americans. I mean, the Amer Americans were not ready. Many of them were in Saigon uh, celebrating Tet. But when they got the word, they hurried back to their bases and the American forces repelled every one of their attacks. But still, it was a costly battle. It lasted only 15 days till January or February 15th, 1968. But we lost 1,150 soldiers. But the North Vietnamese lost 39,000 soldiers. Throughout the war, the Americans lost 55,000 soldiers. That's a lot. But the North Vietnamese lost 3.5 million soldiers. Per capita, that would be like the United States losing 27 million soldiers. Yet we lost the war. How do you lose a war when you win every one of the metrics? You win all the major battles. You, you repel every major attack against you. You lose far fewer soldiers than the enemy. It's because we were fighting a finite war. We wanted to get in and get out. But they were fighting an infinite war. They were fighting for their country. Fighting for their lives. We must see our obedience to Christ like an infinite war. This isn't a game. We are fighting for our lives and the lives of every other human being on this planet. But don't forget that you can't fight the life of living in obedience to Christ on your own power. You have to say, God, help me. Holy Spirit, I need your help today. In the second way we can, he, we can live in obedience, Paul moves from appropriate clothing to appropriate behavior. Let us behave decently as in the daytime. Then Paul lists three pairs of things we are to avoid that we tend to do under the cover of darkness. Not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. We're to stay away from partying, and addictions, pornography, and sensuality, and from fighting with people in person or on social media. Paul suggests a third way to live in obedience. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. A putting on Jesus Christ isn't to hide what's inside, but to display our true identity in Christ. Putting on Christ is like placing an emblem on our chest that reminds everybody, ourselves and everybody else, who we are in Christ. What we put on reminds us of who we are. To behave, and helps us to behave properly with greater ease. Police officers, for example, put on uh, a bulletproof vest. It reminds them that they have very dangerous work. They also put on a uniform, which reminds them that they need to live an example to other people. They wear a badge, which reminds them that they represent their city and their citizens. And then they strap on a weapon, which reminds them to steward the lives of the people they meet with great care and restraint. We, we put on Jesus Christ by spending time in the Bible and using our journals or some other journal, coming to church, uh, getting involved in a community group or getting involved in a, a discipleship pairing. We're to put on Jesus Christ. That's something we are to do. Then there's something we're not to do. And do not think about how to gratify 
the desires of the flesh. The flesh is our old sinful nature. When we invite Christ into our lives, the old sinful nature does not go away. It's still there. It still rises up within us. The fact that we're not to think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh sh shows us that sin begins in the mind. It begins with a plan or at least a decision to leave the option open to sin. Instead, we're to plan ahead to make sin inconvenient. Don't plan ahead to make sin easy. Not only are we not to gratify the desire of the sinful nature, but we're not even to think about how to do so. How do we live ready for Christ's return? Love people and obey Jesus Christ. If you've never given your life to Christ, you can give your life to him today and you can become ready for his return. Our memory verse in our journal this week is a great one that summarizes our study. Um, the most important thing I do every week with this journal is to memorize the memory verse. That's the first thing I do. That way I can carry that around with me as I, you know, go about my business during, uh, during the week. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Would you like to learn that with me? I'm supposed to go like that, Mark. <laughs> yes, Dad. Um, okay, so here we go. We're going to learn a verse. So you just repeat after me. Rather, Rather. clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. All right, let's turn this off. We're going with memory now, all right? Okay, you're still, you're repeating after me. Rather, no, 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 you, I'll say it, then you say it. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. All right, let's split the group down the middle. Laura, you're on this side. Cam, you're on that side. Two teams. You guys go first. So uh, repeat after me. Rather, close yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay, it's like we're in a stadium now. You want to be, be louder than the other opponent. Okay, here we go. Ready? Rather, close yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. And do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay, let's do the opposite. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. You just did it. You learned a verse. Huh? Way to go. That is a great summary of what we talked about today. You take these words with you and you live ready for the return of Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for inspiring the Apostle Paul to write these words today that we can live ready for your return by loving people and obeying you. We want to do that, Lord. I'd like to give you a chance to tell that to God. If that's your heart today, would you tell him that you want to love other people? Maybe think of somebody you're having a really hard time loving and tell him that you want to love that person. Or... And, the, and that you want to obey him this week. Maybe there's an area where you're struggling, you're, you're getting defeated, and you want to tell him you want to obey him by his, the power of the Holy Spirit this week. And if you've never given your life to Christ, right now you can invite him to come into your life, forgive your sins, and then you are ready for his return. Everybody, you pray.
Lord God, thank you that your son, Jesus Christ, is returning again. This world seems like it's in such a mess. And to know that you're coming to make everything right uh, is comforting. But we want to be ready for your return. We don't want to be embarrassed and caught unready. So help us to love people and to obey you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.